Hey everyone, this is Chris Grosso with the Indie Spirituals Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. And I am very excited to have my guest Steve Taylor with me today. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Chris. Hello. Um, so before we jump into this, Steve, I just want to read a short bio just to give our audience a little background on you. Uh, Steve Taylor, PhD, is the author of several books on spirituality and psychology, including The Fall and Waking from Sleep. He has also published two books of poetic spiritual reflections, including The Calm Center. He's a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University in the United Kingdom. Since 2011, he has appeared annually in Mind, Body, Spirit magazine's list of the world's 100 most spiritually influential living people. Wow, that's no small feat. That's it's a pretty solid list they put out every year, Steve. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and also I should say congratulations on this new book, The Leap, which how cool that it's, you know, put out by Eckhart Tolle's new imprint and he also wrote the forward that must be a nice feeling to have that. Yeah, that's great. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a nice boost for the book. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it has. <laughs> so, so I'm, very, I'm very, I'm very grateful to Eckhart. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I, I, let's just jump right into it. I think this is a great read. I wanted to start and actually share just a, a little uh, excerpt about it, and then discuss these four um, signs that you talk about that the human race is undergoing a collective awakening. And then from there, we're going to jump into just different areas of the book and see where the conversation takes us. So just to give the audience a little background, um, it says, In spiritual circles, it's often suggested that the human race is in the process of a collective spiritual awakening. One of my aims in writing my new book, The Leap, was to investigate the evidence for this. Is it really true that we're in the process of waking up as a species? Let me first of all explain what I mean by enlightenment, or as I prefer to call it, wakefulness. Think of it as a shift into a more expansive, higher functioning state in which we experience a strong sense of connection with the world around us and other beings, a sense of inner quietness and spaciousness, and a heightened awareness of our surroundings. It's a state in which we transcend identification with the ego mind and let go of much of the anxiety and restless and restless, which afflicts us in our normal state. There are a number of signs that this state is becoming more accessible and more normal to human beings, and that a collective leap is occurring. So you give these four signs, and, I, and I'm and i going to go one by one with them, and, and feel free to go as deep or as little into them as you'd like, but um, I think it's a great way for us to start this conversation. Sign number one you call individual wakefulness. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, one sign is that um, temporary awakening experiences are becoming more common. So these are temporary spiritual experiences or mystical experiences. Sure. And um, there's a lot of research showing that um, over the past 50, 60 years, these experiences have become more common. In Gallup surveys, for example, uh, 50 years ago, maybe 20 percent of people said that they had had spiritual or mystical experiences. But now the figure is more like 60 percent. Wow. And I need, in my own personal research, I've collected a lot of examples of um, temporary awakening experiences. And my own research shows that most people have had at least one. And a lot of people have them regularly. And, um, you know, they, they, they are a familiar part of experience for so many people. Yeah. And they, they are, by definition, temporary. Sure. So it could be a few seconds, a few minutes, maybe a few hours in which you experience a, a more expansive state of being, a sense of connection to your surroundings, right. a heightened sense of beauty and so on, a sense of love and compassion. And they fade away. But even though they fade away, they leave a. An imprint, if you like, they right. they change people um, afterwards. So that's one side. I think these these experiences are becoming more common. Sure, and so so you kind of touched on individual and number two, which is temporary awakening experiences. Um, so I guess we can skip right to number three then, the impulse to awaken. Or if you had anything else to say about the first two, feel free. But oh well, um, yeah, I mean. I think temporary awakening experiences are becoming more common, but also permanent uh, awakening is becoming more common. That means that uh, I think it's becoming more and more common for people to shift into 
an ongoing state of wakefulness. Mm. And, and that often happens in the midst of uh, intense psychological turmoil. Yeah. Uh, for example, if, if maybe if somebody's diagnosed with cancer, if somebody suffers a bereavement, maybe in the midst of alcoholism or addiction or yeah. intense stress. So it's not uncommon for people um, in the midst of this intense psychological turmoil to undergo a shift of identity. Um, so their, their normal ego self collapses in the midst of all this pressure and tension, like a, like a building collapsing in an earthquake. Right. And in its place, a new self arises inside them, like, yeah. a, like a butterfly, a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. And, and that's a spiritual awakening. Often these people don't know anything about spiritual traditions or spiritual practices. Right. They have to do. They have to catch up. Maybe months or years later, they they find out that they've had a spiritual awakening. But at the time, it happens very spontaneously, uh, accidentally, and and that and that experience is becoming more common. More and more people are having this um, this sudden and dramatic uh, opening, which becomes an, uh, a a permanent spiritual state. Yeah. You know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking back to actually my teenage years and uh, I was a fan of what's considered drone music. And it could be, there's many classifications under like heavy metal and there's all these different subgenres. Sub and I always like to drone um, because just like it says, it's very repetitive and droney. And I would listen to these bands and they're, it's very cyclical, you know, it's pulsing and on and on. And I would completely lose myself in that music. And it wasn't until several years later when I took up a meditation practice or I also started um, getting interested in kirtan, um, two different animals, of course, but I started having these same <coughs> transcendental experiences. And it's like, wow. So I was having spiritual experiences as this punk rock teenager, but I had mm. no actual context around it as such. And so that's part of like my passion of what I do today is, you know, helping mm. to, to bridge that for people. But um, yeah, that just came to mind as you're saying that. And I think yeah. people who often report nature mysticism experiences, you know, and they mm. don't even know what it is. It's just all of a sudden they're gone. The ego self is gone. And it's just, it's that oneness. It's life living itself through them. You know, mm. there is no more duality. It's, I hear that often, you know, or making love or any number of examples. Yeah. Of them too. Mm. But yeah, it's really beautiful that, that we all find it in our own way uh, because isn't it accessible at all times? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, we, we think in terms of spiritual practices like meditation, yoga, prayer, right. and so on. And then these practices do sometimes lead to awakening experiences or even permanent awakening but in most cases, awakening experiences occur outside spiritual practices. Right. They, they do occur in the midst of everyday activities. Yeah. In fact, I recently did, a, in my role as a psychologist at my university, I did a study of 100, 100 or so awakening experiences. And I wanted to find out the, the contexts in which they occurred. Yeah. And the highest trigger was actually um, psychological turmoil, about a quarter of them occurred in states of despair or depression or intense stress. Sure. And then just, just below that, it was nature. Nature was also about just below a quarter of the experiences were in the context of nature. Mm -hmm. And and then it was meditation or prayer after that. So that came third after psychological turmoil and nature. And there were other situations like sports, uh, running, right. jogging, swimming, yeah. and also creative activities, listening to music, playing music. But um, I think around three quarters of the context were outside what we would normally call spiritual practices. Yeah, such a, such a good point. I find in my own life, at least, I'm a runner. So very often when I'm out for a five plus mile run, not usually in the shorter runs, but, um, you know, sometimes it, it will happen where it's just I don't even feel my feet anymore. It's just that oneness, which is a beautiful thing or music, of course. Um, I wrote in my second book about uh two different experiences I had, uh, you know, true, honest to God story. One was at a Slayer concert and one was at a Motorhead concert. And they oh, were yeah. two, two of the most, you know, um, non-dualistic, it was just pure loving awareness, witnessing all of this going on. And who would ever Ooh. think, right? 
But that's the point I try to make is if we make ourselves available to it. And of course, those formal practices, I believe, do help us get to that place. So not necessarily. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, true story. It's like and, and I remember just thinking like, wow, you know, there is no way I can doubt the reality of of this spirit or whatever you care to call it. Um, yeah. The oneness here, mm, you know, mm. Slayer and flames around <laughs> me and people going nuts, thousands of people. And it's just, it was all love. It was just a sea of one movement of love. And uh, yeah, yeah anyways, I, know, so, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I had a similar experience when I was uh, 17 years old. It was maybe the first uh, major awakening experience I had. Yeah. And it was at a U2 concert. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was before they became massively successful. So it was quite a small venue, yeah. maybe 5,000 people. But it was, I, I was caught up in this, uh, the oneness of this crowd of people and the, the euphoria and ecstasy of losing my separateness. And there was something trans, a transcendent energy in the auditorium. Yeah. And, and I, I came out of it saying, I said to my friend, wow, that was a, a religious experience. Yeah. So I knew intuitively yeah. that there was something spiritual about it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's so cool. And I, I love the people are finding it elsewhere, you know, because a lot of people aren't really attracted to formal spirituality or that can help them open up to it. You know, it's like, well, I had this experience. Now what do I do with it? What I find a lot um, in my circles is that a lot of the younger hip hop or punk rock, hardcore kids that got involved as teenagers because they were looking for something more, something realer than Mm. what they were experiencing um, this is, you know, 15, 20 years ago, are now taking up practices like Buddhism or Hinduism or reading Eckhart or Adya Shanti or, you know, any mm. of the great mystics, St. John of the Cross, doesn't matter what tradition it's from, but they're finding those answers that they began looking for. And even though those aren't the answers, as Eckhart would say, they're signposts, you know, they're helping guide them, but guide back within. Um, so it's been a really exciting experience for me to watch all these different people as i'm sure you've seen too as a professor just finding their way and uh and having these experiences Mm. yeah i think there's a connection to psychedelic substances psychedelic drugs or psychoactive um entheogens yeah a lot of people have uh, their first glimpse of transcendence through psychedelic substances yeah and i think you know a lot of people know that they have this glimpse, but they know intuitively that psychedelic substances are not the, the way to achieve permanent awakening. Right. But they, but they know they've had a glimpse of something transcendent. Yeah. And eventually they, they turn to more organic spiritual practices, more integrative spiritual practices in order to find a permanent way to that, that glimpse of enlightenment. Yeah, absolutely. I know in my own case, I had uh, done many, many, many psychedelics in my younger years, but never in a spiritual context. So it wasn't until years later where I recognized the role that they played in expanding my consciousness and allowing me to be more open to these ideas that I normally would have been very closed off to because as a teenager, I hated the idea of religion. I And I know religion and spirituality are very different. But, you know, once I stepped foot on to, quote unquote, the path, I realized, wow, I'm very open to this and I am open to I'm at the library taking out Chogyam Trungpa or Pema or, you know, Yogananda. It doesn't matter. Thomas Merton, whomever. Like I was finding truth in all of it. You know, these great mystic teachers, uh, Alan Watts, Ram Das, Ken Wilber, all these great people. And mm. and uh, and I do attribute a lot of that to um the psychedelics earlier in my years. And the one time I did take psychedelics in a spiritual context was the only time I ever actually had a bad trip. And I guess oh, I was really? just, Oh yeah. I guess that was just my sign that, you know, like it's, it's not for you, you know, like you're through that part of your journey and it's time. Um, but, but what do you think? Like, I know you're saying people will take psychedelics and then they tend to find a, most people tend to find a more organic route where they're not necessary. But what are your thoughts on, um, on psychedelics in general in relation to spirituality and awakening? And um, yeah, I think psychedelics, as I said before, can give you a glimpse of transcendence. They can open you to a more expansive vision of reality. Sure. And they can make you aware for the first time, maybe in your life, that your everyday vision of the world is not complete, yeah. that it's uh, it's limited. 
because you know if you experience a certain vision of reality if that's all you know then you accept that you take that for granted it becomes normal to you but if you take a maybe LSD or ayahuasca then suddenly you realize wow this is only part of the story there's so much beyond this there's this there's this expansive realm of reality for me to explore so they can be very useful in that way and they can also make people humble you know they can make people realize wow I don't really know anything, you know. I'm so uh, I've been so arrogant, presuming to know the truth about the world, and presuming that the world functions according to basic materialist principles. Right. So, so that can be very useful for, for people. But I think if people carry on taking psychedelics, I think in, in a sense they can be misleading because they show you the place where you should be, mm. but they don't give you the route to get there. You know, they don't offer you a way to get there. Right. So, so if you think they are the way to get there, then you'll be confused and you won't get there. Right. Uh, you're more likely to suffer psychological disturbance. Yes, right. So, I, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, it, it's making me think of um, Maharaji, who is Ram Dass's guru. I remember, um, I believe in Ram Dass's Be Here Now book, he writes about Maharaji talking to him about psychedelics and how it was important that they came to the West at the time they did in the 50s or 60s because it was a very materialistic culture, which it still is. But at that time, that was what we needed here. But the point Maharaji made was that, yes, they will get you in the room to see the face of Christ, but inevitably you are going to have to walk out of that room because you took a substance to get in there. The trick is to walk in the room and not have to leave. And you can't do that through a substance. And I, and the other thought I had was when you were saying how it can be humbling, that bad trip I had mentioned to you, the last one I took, I remember I called my parents for some reason. I don't know. I didn't call any friends. I just called my parents and they came and picked me up. Um, and I remember walking out to their car and it was uh, nighttime and the stars were out and I looked up and the only thing I could think of to say is that it's all too real. And that was a mm. very humbling experience. Like it was, it was too real. It was too much for mm. me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that's, a, I, to me, that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, mm. it was very humbling. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, it showed me, I, I had no idea <laughs> what was mm. really going on. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Because, um, the more expansive reality of wakefulness, it can be too powerful. You know, if you don't have psychological structures to kind of protect you, yeah. it can overwhelm you. Yeah. It's a bit like you know, you know, Plato's myth of the cave, right? Yeah, uh, where Plato said that um, we just we just stare at the shadows on the wall of the cave rather than looking at reality itself. Yeah, he said that if we could actually turn around and see reality itself, it would blind us. It'd be so powerful that we would be blinded. So you have to have a, and I know many people think that awakening means the complete dissolution of the self. Right. And it means a state of no self. But I don't think that's completely true. It's true in a sense, in, in the, it's true in the sense that in order to awaken, your normal self has to dissolve away. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to replace. It doesn't mean a state of no self. Right. There has to be something there. Otherwise, you'll just be overwhelmed by the by the uh, the power and the depth of the reality you perceive. So I think of awakening as a, a shift from an ego self to a very subtle, a very soft new sense of self, which is so subtle that you may not even notice it's there, mm. but it still has psychological structures that enable you to focus, to remember, to organize your life, to be practical, to, you know, to function in the world. You yeah. have to have some psychological structures to function in the world of course and that entails a kind of a center a sense of some sense of eyeness right. some sense of self and if you don't have that then you, well that's really equivalent to psychosis if you don't have any psychological structures at all and that's really the problem that psychedelics can lead to is that they ultimately if you take them very regularly they can dissolve away your psychological structures and lead to a, a state um akin to psychosis. Yes, right. I remember, I think it was Eckhart uh, that was talking about at one point uh, people expressing fear of like, well, what if I awaken and become enlightened and, you know, I, am I going to be able to like 
keep myself from going to the bathroom? Like, am I going to lose all sense of like, you know, you know, they're scared of psychosis. So, um, Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's funny that, um, you know, that that's a concern and I'm glad that that's addressed by you you and, and him and many other teachers. Um, I did want to ask you though, Steve, before we talk a little bit more about the book, about your own experience with this, about, you know, Steve before awakening and Steve now, and, and if you don't mind sharing about how it happened for you. Well, um, in the leap, I suggest that awakening can occur in three different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, so firstly, there is a natural awakening or natural wakefulness, which is when a person just is awake as their normal state, which they've always known, or maybe more strictly speaking, it's something that they never lost. I think most people, We're awake to some degree in childhood, in early childhood, but we lose it as we become adults. Well, some people never lose it. They retain the natural wakefulness of childhood. And also there's gradual wakefulness, which is when we follow spiritual practices and um, over many years or decades, we gradually awaken. And then there's sudden dramatic wakefulness, which usually occurs in the midst of psychological turmoil. So I, I see myself as an example of natural wakefulness. When I was um, 16 years old, I began to have what I realize now were awakening experiences. Um, 16, 17 years old, I'd love to, I found myself wandering in parks uh, or in the countryside, uh, wherever wherever I could find a natural space. I'd love to wander alone and just stare at the sky and feel the stillness of nature around me. And I felt a sense of connection to nature. And I felt in a state of you know, tremendous ecstasy, uh, tremendous serenity and calmness. Mm. Um, and they were just natural to me. I didn't understand them at the time. It took me many years to realize that I was having awakening experiences. Yeah. And the, it wasn't very, you know, in some ways it was quite difficult because my environment was very secular, non-religious, non-spiritual, kind of working class, non-intellectual. So I couldn't make sense of the experiences. I thought there was, there was something wrong with me. I thought I was, I wondered why I was so strange and so different to other people. And I found it difficult to function um, in ordinary life. I found it difficult to socialize. You know, the idea of uh, getting some kind of career completely uh, confused me. And it was, it was only maybe five or six years later when I was in my early 20s that I began to read spiritual texts and I began to meditate. And finally, you know, I had a, I developed a framework to make sense of my experiences. I realized that I was having mystical experiences, mm. that I was experiencing wakefulness. And once I had that framework around me, um, you know, life began to be a lot easier. You know, I, uh, I, knew I understood myself, I accepted myself, and uh, I began to integrate my natural wakefulness into my life. Right. And now you, so as a perfect example, it's not like you ran off to a cave in the Himalayas and, you know, just live there. You are a professor and you are a writer and, you know, and and so you still live what a person would call a typically normal life. It's just from a different vantage point. It doesn't seem very normal to me. No, it does. (laughs) No, no, yeah, I know know what you mean. The outside looking in. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I know, I know what you mean, but yeah. it did take a long time, though. You know, um, for ten years or so, I found it, I found it really difficult to function in the ordinary world. You know, to sort of hold down a job and to earn money and to socialize and that kind of thing. Yeah, probably took me until my my late twenties before I became became really able to function. And uh, it was a question of integration. Sure, um, I think. Well, so we're talking a lot about, you know, awakening or mindfulness or not, not mindfulness, wakefulness and enlightenment. And I know you talked a little bit about it before, but that can be a very, very tricky topic to discuss. One that I usually steer away, or, or steer away from, but I really appreciate the way that you lay it out. And I was wondering if we, you don't, wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about, from your experience, what spirituality or spiritually awakened enlightened what that actually is again from your vantage point Mm -hmm. i'm not particularly fond of the word enlightenment sure um, yeah partly because it it suggests that uh wakefulness is something rather esoteric and something rarefied yeah something which is difficult to attain right and difficult to hold on to 
And also, it's a, it's a mistranslation of the, of the word, the, the Buddhist word, the Pali word bodhi, mm. which, which is closer to wakefulness. Yeah. So I prefer to use the term wakefulness. And, and I think that wakefulness is, in some ways, quite ordinary. And I think it's much more common than most people realize. Mm. And there are lots of degrees as well. It's not a question of being asleep and awake or unenlightened and enlightened. There are many different gradations of wakefulness, yeah. ranging from a low degree to a very intense degree. And wakefulness to me is a more expansive and a more intense state of being, um, which has a number of um, important characteristics. One of them is in terms of perception, there's a kind of what I call a de-automatization of perception, which basically means that the world around us, the phenomenal world around us becomes much more real mm. and more vivid as a quality of isness. Yes. And we no longer take the world around us for granted. It becomes, you know, um, awe inspiring. It becomes full of wonder and strangeness. Right. You know, so we tend to find ourselves looking at seemingly mundane everyday things in one day, you know, things that most people wouldn't notice we, we pay attention to and, mm. and are really struck by their beauty and strangeness. And also um, inwardly, uh, there's a sense in which our relationship to our thoughts changes. Um, on the one hand, our thoughts become quieter, uh, slower. We don't have as many thoughts as, as we used to or as other people do. Uh, but maybe more importantly, there's a there's a disidentification from our thoughts. Mm. I think in the sleep state, we tend to people tend to become immersed in their thoughts and become carried away by them. They think they are their thoughts. Right. But when we wake up, we realize, wow, it's, this is just a kind of process which is taking place in my mind. It's like a, a TV which is on in the background, you know, chattering away. Mm. It's a bit like, um, you know, we have digestive processes the circulation of the blood, all, all of these physiological processes. And thinking is just, is a just, it's just like that. It's a kind of automatic physiological process, which we don't have to uh, pay attention to or we don't have to identify with it. So there's this, uh, this di a distance opens up between us and our thoughts. There's a space between us and our thoughts. And as a result of that, thinking does become quieter as well. Mm. And... Another change is um, there are some kind of conceptual changes in the way that we relate to the world and the way that we understand the world. And one is that we have a, well, we lose the scent or the need for group identity. Mm. So in the, in the sleep state, people have a strong need to identify themselves with groups, with uh, nations or ethnic groups, religions, politics. Now, I'm a I'm a Democrat, a Republican, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, LA Lakers fan, Manchester United fan, right. whatever. You identify yourself as a member of a group and it gives you, it strengthens your sense of identity. It gives you a stronger sense of who you are. But in, in, uh, in awakening, that fades away. We lose the need for group identity mm. and we only identify ourselves as members of the human race as living beings, if anything at all. Mm. And, and as a result, we develop a much more inclusive and a much more empathic, a much more wide ranging compassion and empathy for other human beings, no matter how they may be superficially different to us. So things like religion, race, uh, ethnicity, they just lose any sense of importance to us. Right. And, and another change, uh, it also changes the way we live outwardly in the world. Um, so one change is that we become um, less materialistic and less accumulative in general. We're not so concerned with gaining success or status or power or wealth. Instead, we have a strong need to, to contribute. So that there's a shift out of the mode of accumulation into a mode of contribution. Mm. So, that, so the main focus of our lives becomes altruism. Um, we may feel a sense of mission to encourage the human race's development and so on. So there are, there are lots of changes, really, but those, uh, those are some of the most important ones. Yeah. Well, I've experienced many of 
the, what you just uh, described. But the thing that I find interesting for myself, I'll throw myself under the bus here, and uh, but I'm sure other people can relate, is that I will have these experiences and they will stay for a little while. You know, I remember the first time in Buddhism what they call stream entry, where it was the the no self. It was life lifing itself through this body of Chris, just an extension, just like the trees outside of my window. No difference. It's just one movement, the dance of life. And it was amazing, you know, and uh, it lasted five minutes maybe. And that's just one of many experiences I've had. Some have come, stayed a little while, and, you know, then left, and some have stayed a little longer. Uh, But it's a back and forth, a back and forth, you know, and then I'll go several weeks, uh, even while practicing meditation, why not, of having none of those experiences, knowing that this Chris self is just a a made up identity one that is here to function in the world but there is you know in buddhism we have the ultimate reality and relative and here's relative and ultimate underlying and just to you know use that as a reference um and i and i'm aware of that and i'm aware of the awareness you know that's underlying the thoughts but i'm Mm -hmm. still getting caught in the thoughts and i'm still getting caught in the story of chris and chris still gets frustrated at things Mm -hmm. and you know, so what are your thoughts on that? And not just about mm. me, but in general. I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping that I'm not like the only one that goes through that. Um, is that a phenomenon that you are <laughs> familiar with, or am I just batshit crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's completely normal, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are lots of um, there's some characteristics of wakefulness are not really overt. They're kind of like underlying characteristics which we're not always aware of. Sure. For example, that the sense of um, all-embracing um, compassion for the human race, uh, the sense of uh, well, the, the loss of group identity and the identification with the human race as a whole indiscriminately, that kind of like underlying characteristics which are not so overt. And also, you know, the, 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 the non-materialism, the desire to live simply um, and the loss of uh, loss of desire for success and power. Mm. They're, they're, they're very kind of like um, nascent underlying characteristics. So I'd say that, you know, um, a lot of people have those characteristics underlying, but because they're not as obvious as like things like thoughts and perceptions, right. they're not always aware of them. So they're, you know, the wakefulness is always there underlying, right. even if it's not overt. And I think we're always, uh, you know, I think we're all moving to a more intense degree of wakefulness. Mm-hmm. So we're all mo- we're all maybe moving from a lower part of the spectrum to a higher part of the spectrum. So when we have temporary experiences of mental quietness, temporary experiences of oneness, we're just temporarily shifting a bit higher along the spectrum. And then, you know, the experiences fades, the experience fades, and we revert to our previous lower level of wakefulness. Mm. But I think in the long run, you know, even if it takes years or decades, we're moving very gradually, very slowly towards those more intense levels. And it's just, I think those experiences are a little glimpse of what's ahead. You know, they're a little glimpse of what we're moving towards. Mm. Well, good to know. At least I'm on the right trajectory. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, it's a good sign. So yeah, it's good. Because I do resonate with with almost everything you said. And uh, so that that is good to know. Um so there's a lot of people that begin to have these experiences and they want to put context to them. And so they start reading books or watching YouTube videos, Googling, um, seeking out teachers and something that um, I think is so important. And this dates back, you know, as far back as there's been spiritual teachers, you know, there's been fraudulent spiritual teachers. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the difference between what you might consider a fraudulent teacher or someone who's generally awakened and, and how as a student can we be aware of that so as to not be taken advantage of? Because there are so many cases, you know, of misappropriation, you know, the way students have been treated and a lot of psychological and damage and traumas happen because of that. Mm. That's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to write the book, The Leap yeah. and and do the research before the book because, um, you know, so many people have a, a different concept of spiritual awakening and it means something different to different people. And it, it's very difficult to pin down what it actually means. Right. 
So I, I try to um, identify the characteristics of awakening. And actually, I developed with uh, my co-research, we developed uh, an inventory of spiritual awakening to try to identify, highlight the characteristics. You know, we spoke to around 50 awakened individuals and you know, looked at the characteristics they share. Those became part of the inventory. And yeah, as you say, you know, unless you have a really clear, clear idea about what awakening is, and it's easy to be taken in by fraudulent teachers or narcissistic teachers, yeah. or even one thing which is quite common is that teachers were very purely awakened to begin with, but they slowly become corrupted by the adoration mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, unquestioning um, admiration and respect of their followers. So a few years a few de maybe a couple of decades on, they become exploitative spiritual teachers. Sure. So I think one of the things to be aware of is, you know, genuine wakefulness is non-hierarchical, and there's no sense of exclusion. So I think if teachers set themselves apart from their followers, their disciples, if there becomes a sense of hierarchy, uh, that's a sign that a teacher is not genuinely awakened. If there's any sense of power, any sense that they're accumulating power, accumulating wealth, that's a bad sign. And if they become dismissive of other teachers or the traditions, mm. that's also very questionable because genuinely, genuine wakefulness is very open. It's very uh, non-denominational and any kind of exclusivism, exclusivism yes. um, is, is a, a bad sign. So and any, any kind of any sign of immoral, unethical behavior, I mean, awakened people are very compassionate, very empathic. That's part of what wakefulness is. That's part of what losing separation means to become. It becomes impossible to know to consciously injure uh, another human being. Right. Uh, so if there's any signs that an awakened, a so-called enlightened teacher is behaving in any of those ways, then it's a, it's, you know, it's a very dodgy, as we say in England, dodgy sign. Dodgy sign. <laughs> yeah. So those are great pointers to, to look out for. I do appreciate you sharing that. Um, are there any teachers, I, I know I try not to name names, but is there any that you would suggest, you know, besides yourself that, you know, people might, in your own opinion, look towards and not as a personal teacher, but maybe even authors or people in the field right now that they might be able to take a book out of the library or, you know, find a video on YouTube just to get a better sense of things. There's a man um, here in Manchester in England where I live. Yeah. Uh, he's a guy called Russell Williams and he's 96. In fact, he had his 96th birthday two days ago. Wow. And he's been a spiritual teacher for probably 60 years now, 60 years or more. Yeah. Uh, very quietly, you know, he's, he's never attracted um attention never attracted publicity yeah. and so very quietly for the past few decades he be, he's been working with small groups of people here in manchester around the north of england and he's never charged any money for any of his uh, mm -hmm. teachings or any of his meetings they're completely free completely open to anybody and he's somebody who, who became awakened accidentally um in the late 1950s, I believe, mm. after all the trauma of the Second World War and the trauma of his early life. Yeah. And he's just becoming a little more widely known now. Uh, he, he published a book two years ago, his first book. Oh, good. And uh, he still has meetings twice a week. But he's an example of somebody who's very ordinary. You know, I think the most highly awakened people are extremely ordinary. You know, if you pass them in the street, you wouldn't think, oh, wow, there's an enlightened being. Right. You, you maybe you'd be aware of their kindness yeah. and their compassion, but they seem outwardly completely normal. You know, they don't wear robes. Right. They don't shave their heads necessarily. Yeah. And, you know, he's somebody who stands outside any particular tradition. He's associated with Buddhism, but he, he doesn't call himself a Buddhist. Sure. So for me, the most um, striking awakened people are the ones who are outside traditions, the ones who found wakefulness accidentally mm. or spontaneously, and the ones who don't try, attract, try and attract attention. You know, they don't sort of uh, 
um, proclaim themselves of avatars as avatars or as saviors. Right. You know, they're happy if people come to them, but they have no need for for power or status. Yeah. And this gentleman's name again, can you repeat that for me? He's called Russell Williams. Russell Williams. Yeah. No, a couple of years ago, I helped him write a book called Not I, Not Other Than I, The Teachings of Russell Williams. Wonderful. Is it available on Amazon? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. There's a... There's a there's not much, um, because he's always avoided publicity, there's not much around on YouTube or on the internet. There's a few sure. videos on YouTube. Yeah. Well, that's great. I will personally look him up, but uh, anyone mm. listening, I obviously check him out. That's great. Thanks for sharing his, his uh, a bit about him with us. Something I, I wanted to also talk to you about um, was the different theories of consciousness or how they explain or try to debunk mystical or awakening experiences you know i've heard a lot talked about that um back and forth um so i would love to hear your you know your thoughts on that subject the standard uh, way of explaining spiritual experiences is in terms of brain activity you know mm-hmm. well the, the standard way of explaining consciousness is in terms of brain activity so you know this is the materialist view that basically all that exists is matter physical stuff mm-hmm. So mind is really a projection of matter. You know, your thoughts are produced by brain cells whirling around in your brain. And your, all of your feelings, all of your experiences are produced by uh, neural activity of some form or another. Or maybe uh, brain chemicals and hormones and so forth. So spiritual experiences are, you know, people try to explain them in terms of certain brain chemicals or brain activity in certain areas of the brain but um you know it's a very flawed way of experiencing it doesn't make any sense at all to me first of all because um one big problem is that there's no evidence at all that consciousness or mental activity is produced by the brain we know that it's related to the brain in some way but there's no evidence at all that the brain generates it you know there's Nobody's ever tracked a thought down to a particular bit of the brain. Nobody's ever tracked an experience down to a particular bit of the brain. And to me, it makes much more sense to believe that consciousness is something beyond the brain. It's a, a fundamental quality of the universe. Mm. And, you know, a bit, a bit like, you know, we have fundamental forces like gravity, electromagnetism. They were there from the beginning of the universe. They're kind of embedded Right. into the fabric of the universe. And I think consciousness is the same. Consciousness was there from the beginning of the universe. It was embedded into the fabric of the universe. Mm. And therefore, when we become individually conscious, what we're experiencing is a, is a kind of influx of universal consciousness. I think the brain functions not to produce consciousness, but it acts to kind of pick up receive consciousness from out there and canalize it into our individual being and i think i think when we have spiritual experiences or awakening experiences we're touching into that universal consciousness we're we're getting in touch with our essence our essence is always universal consciousness Mm -hmm. but a lot of the time we don't experience it because our, our minds are so busy our lives are so busy right there's a lot of turmoil, disturbance inside us and in our lives. Yeah. But when all of that fades away and we become quiet inside ourselves, then, you know, we touch into that essence, that universal consciousness again. You know, I appreciate you saying that. And it's reminding me of, um, I don't remember the quote verbatim, but something Max Planck had said quite some time ago, uh, in the 40s, I think, about, you know, that there is this universal force um, that he calls spirit, I believe. And uh, it is like the matrix that makes up all matter. You know, there is this awareness that is conscious and and consciously creating out of this quantum soup, however you want to call it. Um, and, and, And I appreciate how you're saying, you know, and then our brain is kind of receiving and now we're experiencing it and we can tap back into it. Um, but as you're saying that, I'm thinking about ego and, you know, ego, I see how it's a necessary part, especially as we're developing as humans, you know, that protect ourselves and 
and um, you know, especially thinking back to the caveman era. And here we are still evolving as human beings. Um, and you know, you hear some teachers say you must destroy the ego. Others say you m- must make friends with it. You know, there's all these different sides of the of the coin. And I remember, and this leads me to to um, maybe our last question, where you know, I, I wanted to ask you about signs that the human race is undergoing a collective awakening. But uh, before I do, I, I just wanted to share. I remember listening many years ago to an interview between Tammy Simon of Sounds True and Eckhart Tolle. And it was, I think, the day of or the day after the 9-11 tragedy here in New York City. Mm. And I remember Eckhart was, you know, very staunch in his position that, yes, you know, humanity is awakening collectively, no doubt about it. And Tammy kind of surprised me because I know she's a huge fan of Eckhart Um and she said something to the effect of, but don't you think that that might be the way certain people perceive it just because they're in their own bubbles and that's what they surround themselves with? Like, mm. it's mm. just they're in these circles of people that are all about awakening. And isn't that a possibility? And you could tell it kind of took him off guard and, and he kind of agreed with her. You know, he's like, I, I hear what you're saying. And ever since I heard that, it's always been very important for me to not just stay in spiritual circles. I have friends that, are into all sorts of different things. And for me, it also Mm. makes life interesting and kind of keeps things in perspective for me. So all of that said, um, what are your, what are, you know, I mean, I'm assuming there are signs that we're undergoing some kind of collective awakening. I don't know. I mean, Barbara Marks Hubbard, I talked to her a while back. She believes that humans will one day be light beings, possibly, you know, we came from the ocean Mm. and we're still evolving and, I know I just kind of went all over the place. I apologize. So to rein it back in, what are the signs from your perspective that the human race is undergoing a collective awakening? Yeah, I do think we are undergoing a, an evolutionary leap. Mm. Um, and we, we touched on some of them right at the beginning, you know, sure. the individual signs that yep. I think uh, more and more people are having temporary awakening experiences. More and more people are shifting into a, a permanent state of wakefulness. Right. I think in general, more and more people are feeling drawn towards spiritual practices and drawn towards systems of self-development. I think over the last few decades, it's probably been the the most significant cultural trend in in Europe and America and other parts of the world. This amazing upsurge in self-development and an interest in spirituality. Um, but from a cultural perspective, I think there are also signs that we are undergoing a spiritual awakening. I think it's, it's very important to take the long view. I think these signs have been taking place for several centuries, sure. maybe 300, 400 years. Mm. And I think, you know, if you go back to the let's go back to, say, the 17th century, um, you know, let's go back to 17th century England, where I live, you know, yeah. Um Life was incredibly brutal. There was an amazing lack of compassion. Children were treated very brutally. Criminals were executed, and um, they still are in the United States. Oh, yes. In other parts of the world. But, um, yeah, there were amazingly brutal forms of punishment. Um, Different sections of society, disabled people, were were abused and treated very badly. And, you know, if we went back to that time, we'd be amazed at the lack of compassion. And also the lack of equality, you know, women were treated very badly. Lower groups of society were treated incredibly unfairly. Everybody was treated incredibly unfairly, apart from a small elite group at the top of the tree. And it was only really in the 18th century, towards the end of the 18th century, that things began to change. You know, there was a a lot of new movements began at the end of the 18th century. The anti-slavery movement, the women's rights movement, the animal rights movements. Um, the movement towards democracy, ideals of egalitarianism and democracy, socialism, all of these ideals began at that period, the second half of the 18th century. It was, it was also the time of the romantic movement in poetry and music when people began to connect with nature and connect with their inner feelings, their inner beings, and describe them in poetry and music. So there was a major shift in, in humanity which took place at that time. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the first sign that we were beginning to transcend uh, separateness, to transcend our highly, our our strongly developed sense of ego. Mm. 
mm. which had been, you know, the human being's normal state for thousands of years before then. But there was this amazing upsurge of compassion um, and ability to see the world from other people's perspectives, an increase in a sense of fairness and equality. And these these trends continued through the 19th century, through the 20th century, despite all of the, you know, the Second World War, lots of disasters and catastrophes, but there were still these trends. And in the, in the 20th century, there was this amazing acceptance of the human body, this acceptance of sexuality. Right. You know, in the Victorian area, sexuality was very highly repressed. Right. But there was a new sense of openness towards the body and a stronger sense of connection to nature, which manifested itself in environmental uh, causes and ecological awareness and so forth. So all of these trends have been continuing from the 18th century right until the present day. And there were lots of terrible things happening in the world, you know, in politics, particularly yeah. in Britain, we've had Brexit and right. a lot of countries have shifted towards the right. And there seems to be a temporary increase in nationalism. But I think even in a strange way, that could be a sign that a collective awakening is underway. Um, because whenever a new phase begins, there's always a lot of resistance to it. The, the old characteristics try to become more rigid because they, they feel threatened. I think the kind of the people who feel you know, a strong sense of group identity, the people who are clinging to the old ideals of nationalism and patriarchy and domination, they're feeling threatened by this rising tide of increasing compassion and wakefulness. Sure. So I think because they feel so threatened, they're trying to just hold on. They're trying to make themselves more rigid. So I think there are all these signs that, you know, over 300, 400 years, there's been this increasing transcendence of separation an increasing interconnection and an increasing connection with nature and to the whole universe. So I think, you know, th these are signs that uh, an, evolution, an evolutionary leap is underway. Mm. You know, I've heard it said that chaos precipitates great change. And I've thought of that often over this almost last year since what happened here in the U.S. Yeah. And it was interesting for me. I was living in Canada and uh, unfortunately got divorced and moved back right before the election. And so, I mean, I was glad to hear to, uh, to vote. But um, to watch the shift and to watch people kind of come out from under the rocks or in the woodwork and that hateful rhetoric become much more um, tolerable and acceptable. Mm. And aside from all of, you know, these police shootings of innocent African-Americans and, you know, so on the one hand, there is, of course, so much beauty and compassion and it's wonderful that it's happening. But I really do appreciate what you were saying about how, you know, the old guard likes to fight back before these, you know, these big shifts do happen. And um, and that's the hope I think I hold in my heart because, Yes, you, you've experienced a lot where you are with Brexit and what's happening. And obviously, I don't want to use the word turmoil, but things are we're on very shaky ground here in the U.S. Um, mm. It's a very divided time to be here. Um, and then the actions our president is creating throughout the world and with global warming, it's uh, it's scary, to say the least. But mm. I, uh, I really appreciate your sentiment that... Um, Things like that often do happen before great change. And, and I've also seen it make people become more diligent in their practice, become more loving towards their neighbor and cultivate that compassion and loving kindness and share it more freely. So it's not that it's all negative for sure. So thank you for your take on yeah. that. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. I think that's a, a nice spot to end on unless um, actually we do have a couple of minutes. So one, I wanted to ask uh, where people can find you online, but two, give you the chance to share anything from the book that I did not discuss because there's so much more we could have talked about. So first mm. of all, where can people find you online? Or um, I mean, the book is Leap, The Psychology of Spiritual Awakening, available everywhere books are sold. Um, and your website is on there. I could even read it. Sorry. It's stephenmtaylor.com. And that's Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, M like Mary, Taylor.com. But yeah, so Stephen, in these last few minutes, is there something we didn't discuss from the book that you would like to share? Um, maybe only that um, I found that uh, a lot of people who undergo very sudden and dramatic awakening 
particularly if they don't have a background in spiritual practices. Yeah. They often experience difficulties. Um, they experience confusion. Mm. Um, they feel disorientated. And there may also be psychological disturbances, that problems with concentration, memory, and strange energies in their body, even physical problems like pain and fatigue sure. and these things. And it's because their, their whole organism, their whole mind-body complex has undergone a, a major shift. Mm. So the whole thing has been thrown into disturbance. And a lot of people are diagnosed as uh, being psychotic, or schizophrenic and particularly if they don't know about spiritual awakening they maybe go to see the doctor and the doctor doesn't know about spiritual awakening so right. uh, they're given medication maybe taken to a psychiatric institution right. so unfortunately that's quite common so i think it's, it's just i think people should be aware that if they do go through this disturbing awakening process they need to trust uh, that they're going through a tr positive transformational process which can be disturbing, but I found that it always fades away if you hang on and if you have support around you, yeah. and if you understand what you're going through, then the disturbing side effects always fade away and you always return to a very settled and integrated state, even if it can take years, but you know, it's a process, a transformational process always leads to stability integration and permanent wakefulness yeah beautiful such an important point to make thank you for sharing that it's so important well Stephen, thank you for your time it has been a real pleasure um i loved your book this was a wonderful conversation like i said we could have talked for another hour because there's so much more you cover in it but um we'll have to have you back on sometime in the future so we can dig a little deeper or talk about whatever else you might have going on that's new um but thank you, really. Thank you for the work you're doing, and uh, and it's much needed and much appreciated in the world. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed talking to you, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll talk again sometime. All right, I look forward to it. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Be well. You're welcome. You too. Bye. Bye.